Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where we meet at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time, and thank you for joining us on this, another fantastic and excellent Latter Gay Stories episode. The Latter Gay Story, uh, Stories Podcast is your opportunity to better understand the LGBTQ experience by getting to know and understand an individual story. We thank you for joining us and we hope that you'll share this episode and other episodes like it. If you are listening on the audio version through our one of our podcast players, we invite you to subscribe to this channel wherever you are listening. The Latter Gay Stories Podcast is available everywhere you catch your favorite audio podcast Casts. We are on Google, uh, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Apple, and all the other ones as well. Wherever you do listen, please hit that subscribe button, and we will get you the latest up, uh, episodes pushed directly to your mobile device. Uh, mobile device. <laughs> so that's the fun of it. Um, and we do give you some exclusive content as well for subscribing to the channel. If you are watching on our video version, as always, we have the live chats on our Facebook and YouTube channels. Again, if you are listening on an, on an audio version and not aware, we do have every one of these episodes as a video version, so you can watch the guests. And uh, if you're catching us on the premiere, you can um, uh, follow along on the live chat and comment as we go through this episode. It does give us an opportunity to create a little bit of a sense of community, and we can discuss the episode as it opens up in real time. And if you are catching it later after the premiere, we do welcome your chats and your comments in the um, uh, both on our Facebook and our YouTube channels. And again, that gives us an opportunity to uh, meet together oft and to be able to discuss episodes just like this. This episode and others are also available online on our website at LatterGayStories.org. We invite you to walk over to the website and check out this episode as, long, as well as our blog uh, posts and a lot of the fun things that we're doing online at LatterGayStories.org. Now, this episode, as you've read the teaser, I'm sure, um, is unique and fun, and I'm excited to be able to um, uh, bring Coulter into this discussion to be able to have um, a unique conversation about uh, spirituality, about um, moving forward after coming out, about finding happiness and success and spiritual experiences and joy on this side of the aisle. I was thinking about this previous to having um, previously uh, previous to doing this episode, and I thought of years ago, President uh, Ballard, um, an apostle of the LDS Church said, of those who leave the Mormon faith, he said, but where will you go? If you leave the church, you will not find any happiness. You will no longer find spiritual experiences. You won't be as fulfilled as you once were within the church. And I hope that we use this episode, especially to, uh, to the queer audience, to those who identify somewhere along the LGBTQ spectrum. You can take something from this episode and see that there are places to go after Mormonism. Because in a very real sense, so much of Mormonism has uh, effectively taught us that there are no spiritual experiences, there are no happy spots, there is no fullness of truth outside of the church. And I think we can use episodes like this and others to be able to show that there are places to go, and there are spiritual experiences to be had, and there is life after Mormonism. Uh, with that, I want to welcome to the podcast um, Coulter Wild. Now, Coulter, you grew up in Provo. Uh, you're a Utahn, um, a Provoite. You came out um, at 16 and navigated a world of that's new and not many manuals or written uh, books to teach you how to to navigate a world being gay and Mormon at the same time, and your family dynamic as well. There was also, in this episode, we're going to talk about um, some traumatic experiences that happened within your family that m caused a rift, in a, a rift in a divide, and how we move forward and past those. And then, as we talked about in the, in the introduction, about um, finding sense of self and finding spirituality and connection. Um, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Kyle. Um, what part of the introduction uh, did I miss that you wanted to wanted to clarify or add to? Oh, I mean, we can just go ahead and start in the beginning. I feel like you you covered the basic synopsis, and I'm sure we're going to get into more detail throughout. Let's do it. So. Uh, Genesis one one, <laughs> and in the Maybe beginning, we can start a little a little later than that. <laughs> so, growing up in Provo, 
um, which is uh, for those who are not familiar with um, the the Mormon Mecca, Provo really, aside from Salt Lake City, is the heart of the lion's den. It is very conservative. It is very Mormon. Uh, it is very orthodox. What was it like growing up as a gay kid in a Mormon family in Provo, Utah? You know, it was really isolating overall. Um, I had, I have a great family, a lot of love for my family. I am fourth of five children. Um, my parents have been together throughout my, my growing up and adult life. And my family overall is pretty close. We spend quite a bit of time together. I grew up in a really great neighborhood that had a park and other kids my age and things like that. But there was always just this feeling that I was different, that I didn't quite fit into the mold. And for a lot of years, I wasn't sure why. I wasn't sure what it was. I wasn't sure why I didn't necessarily always feel comfortable playing with the other boys or why I didn't always feel comfortable at church. Um, but, you know, fast forward years later and looking back, I can see many reasons why, not just that I was gay, um, that there were a lot of parts of myself, a lot of frequencies happening within me that weren't really safe to express or explore in that lion's den of Provo, that Mormon Mecca. So uh, you talk a little bit about growing up in the church. Any unique church experiences? You said you there were, f there were feelings that you felt um, a little different. How I've had hundreds of interviews and it's always fascinating to me to see how people uh, put language to these feelings of being different. Cause often we don't have, we don't have the ability to define what different is. We grow up gay, but we don't, we don't know what that word gay means. We don't, we, we know we're different. We have no language to attach that difference to, uh, to you. What did that difference look like? Yeah. So for me, a big part of it, Mm, give me just one moment, tap into this. So a big part of it was, um, I think my sensitivity, like just being more sensitive than the other boys in my ward, um, being more, having maybe a different awareness of people's emotions, of energies, of things like that, also very empathic. And so I was always just like on, on guard. I felt like I had to be on guard a little bit, never really was able to settle in and feel fully safe and fully myself unless I was by myself in nature. Like as a little kid, I was always um, escaping off to the park or off to the hills wherever I could find a quiet space to just like be with the flowers and hang out with the honeybees and things like that. And in that space, I was like, oh yes, everything's good. I'm great. I'm taken care of. I'm supported. Um, but then, you know, going back home, going back to church, going back to school, things like that, it was back to like having, putting the mask on, having the persona, you know? And even though looking back, I was not always really great at the persona because I remember being very young, probably, you know, seven or eight years old and having another kid in class say, you're gay and be like, what's gay? I didn't even know what gay was, you know? Um, or having other kids be like, oh, you act like a girl or you talk like a girl and being like, oh, well, how, how am I talking differently than the other boys? I don't know. Like, you know, so just not even having that awareness or anything to compare it to and just being a little kid, just trying to be a kid and grow up and live your life and having people giving you these feed, this feedback that you don't, that I didn't understand, um, was really disheartening and worrying to me. What did it take to get to you to get you to the point where you started realizing that um, or connecting the dots, providing language to who and what you are? Was there do you remember certain times was there a certain age where that happened where you started saying, oh, I could be gay um, or those dots were beginning to stars were starting to align. Things were starting to make sense. 
Yeah, I think it was probably in about fourth or fifth grade that I first had the thought, maybe I'm gay. I had um, a friend at the time, another like boy friend that was a boy. <laughs> um, and we were really close and he was also, you know, maybe more, a little more effeminate or whatever. So we could be comfortable around each other and just normal, our normal selves around each other, not having to have the mask up as much. And we would have sleepovers and, you know, nothing sexual ever happened or anything with him, but just kind of that feeling of like, oh, I feel safe with him. And like, we're both kind of different from the other boys. And um, around the same time, it's probably when I started having fantasies of other boys as well. Um, and so, that was just kind of like, a, oh, that's interesting, you know, like I, what I've been taught in church is like, boys don't do these things together, shouldn't do these things together, but I really want to, you know, at the time it was not ne even necessarily anything um, explicitly sexual. It was just like, I wanted to hang out naked with other boys. Like I just wanted it to be normal, like even just wanted it to be normal to just be like naked with my brother and my dad and like have it not be like such a big like oh no cover yourself like we we have to be modest and um you know like there was just a lot of a lot of shame around that how does i think that's really great because i think that's familiar to a lot of us who kind of navigated that world um we all were seeking that level of comfort we all were looking for those spots where we uh, could fit in and looking for those spots where we, especially in this space where we didn't have to necessarily look for um, or hide or run from um, armor or, or run from arrows and, and darts and things that were out there trying to um, attack us and hurt us. Um, as you were starting to connect to those realities, did that change you at all? Was there something inside of you that breaks? Was there something inside of you that blossoms as you're making those realizations? Mm. Um, that's about the time that I started my double life, I would say, of exploring both. Like I definitely, I had that feeling of like, oh, this feels a little bit more peaceful here. This feels a little bit more free over here, you know, like with these certain friends that aren't judgmental or aren't, you know, like, um, maybe aren't in my ward kind of thing. So it's just like, there's not that, that same, um, expectations of like, oh, we're watching each other and like might tell on each other and whatever. And so, um, I definitely at that time started becoming a different person at school versus the person that I was at home or in church. And, um, there was also, you know, I think there was some freedom in that time, just in the, even just questioning, allowing myself to question, am I gay? Could I be gay? Was just, even though I wasn't even, I wasn't ready for years after to say like, yes, I'm gay. Um, there, even just allowing myself the question was like, oh, okay, there could be a reason, there could be an explanation, there could be something here that like, it's not just this crazy enigma that I'm never gonna understand and no one's ever gonna get, and I'm gonna be so alone and whatever, you know, um, was able to just like, at least give myself just that little, that little piece of refreshment, that little piece of space within myself to question like, or to, um, admit like I'm different than than the other boys I'm different than the other kids in school or in 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 the ward especially so you tease that with a double life um what was the op what was the opposite what was the the other part of that life that you were running to or running away from yeah so there was like the really good mormon boy and like I was you know, if, if we were getting grades in Mormonism, like, I feel like I would have been A plus for years of like, I knew all the scripture stories in Sunday school. When I was asked a question, when we were asked a question, I always knew the answer. Um, giving talks in church would just like for weeks after have people come up to me and be like, oh, that was the best youth talk I've heard all year. And you know, what? I, which at the time was like, oh, whatever, and, you know, no big deal. Um, but 
there, there was that part of myself, you know, that like got a lot of validation from that. But then the other part that knew it was kind of a lie. I didn't really feel it, you know, like when I was having, when I knew all the answers and the scripture stories and things like that, it was like, oh yeah, I know the scripture story. I don't feel anything about it. You know, I can tell you like verbatim what happened, um, with Nephi and Laman and Lemuel or whatever, but, um, didn't really have the strong feelings, wasn't really like having this burning in the bosom of a, of a growing testimony. Like it seemed the other kids my age were, it was very much just all intellectual for me. It was like, yes, I understand. I know these stories. I see these things. Um, I can repeat them for you when there's going to be a test because that's what this all is, right? It's a test this whole life. We're just being tested to see if we're good enough to go back to God or not. Um, and so, and then the other end was I started watching pornography. I started um, just exploring sexually a little bit more, exploring my own body. Um, I even remember like skinny dipping at my family's lake house for the first time and that being like so rebellious and so out there, but so freeing and so liberating for me. And so, but, you know, I knew that I couldn't share those things at church. I knew I couldn't talk about those things with my other, like, Mormon church friends in the, um, in the, man, I've been out of the deacon's quorum. I was like, I've been out of it a while. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, I think we roll the honest engine through the the rail station, um, cause you bring up pornography and for so many, uh, Latter-day Saints who will listen to an episode like this, uh, there's this element of cringe. Like we don't want to highlight any of this difficult part of the discussion. Uh, what for you did pornography do? What was, what role did it have in your formation? What role did it have for better or for worse about who you would become? Mm. Yeah, so for me, really, I was first introduced to pornography by an older cousin. And like at, a, at an age where I really didn't, I wasn't necessarily aroused by it, didn't necessarily enjoy it, but I was like, oh, that's interesting, okay. So just kind of started experimenting a little more and watching a little bit more, just starting with your average run-of-the-mill straight pornography that a 12 or 13-year-old boy would be looking at. Um, <clears throat> because he was older than me. And so I was like, you know, in that and like thought it was interesting. And because, you know, because there was that rebelliousness to it, there was the excitement as well. But a little bit later, like it was part of the evolution of me understanding my sexuality as well. You know, like it started off of just like, just solo woman soft core and it was like oh wow that's a lot of skin to see you know like i've never seen that much skin that's exciting and interesting um but once i started seeing like actual uh sexual interaction between people straight couples whatever i noticed that i was very aroused when there was a man involved and then it kind of evolved to the point where I was like, oh, well, I'm not even that interested in seeing naked women right now. Like just a, a naked man is fine. Um, but still, you know, wasn't, wouldn't have called it like gay pornography, wouldn't have called myself gay or anything like that. Um, but knew that it was rebellious and different and definitely wasn't like talking to my friends or showing my friends what I was looking at or anything. Uh, but it allowed me a space to explore that part of myself, you know, like, and I'm sure I would have found other ways had this cousin not shown me, introduced me to the wonderful world of pornography. <laughs> um, but just to have that space where I could just be with myself and explore something that I was interested in that wasn't school and wasn't church related. That was just like, I would go home from school and I mean, sometimes spend hours just be like, what is going on here? Wow. There's like so much going on in the world that I had no idea about. I had no idea that I was so sheltered. 
Uh, so it just opened up a world of possibilities for me in a lot of ways. So is that the point where you are watching this pornography or, or viewing this pornography that then you look at it and get to the point where you start realizing who and what you are? Does the pornography help you to uh, add language to your existence or is that something that happens a little further down the road. I, I just wonder, was it a crucial part of your uh, understanding your identity? Um, or did the realization that I am gay come from something else or at a different time? Mm. Yeah, so I guess really the realization or like even the questioning, like allowing myself to ask myself the question, am I gay, happened before I was into pornography really because it was probably like i said about eight or nine years old when i first like you know was having these fantasies and realizing that maybe other people weren't having the same kinds of fantasies or desires um that i was having but yes the pornography did help me to put deeper language to it and to understand it more deeply and like what that might mean for me beyond just, you know, having a fantasy of hanging out naked with my best friend or whatever. Do you think, I'm just curious here, um, like just real talk, like did it influence and um, help you become a better or worse Latter-day Saint? Was it like doing something like that? Did it um, like viewing pornography, was there, was there an element of it that made you feel like yuck and want to distance yourself from the church? Was there an element of that that was fulfilling? I, I mean, I, and my intent is not to like hammer this topic. I just think it, it, it impacts more people than, than we give it credit for. And nobody really wants to discuss. I mean, it's kind of in today's modern language. It is the Bruno of, of <laughs> uh, discussions like this. Like we just don't talk about it because we don't want it to become our reality or we don't want, want to acknowledge that, um, we don't want to give a name or a face or an identity to the elephant in the room. But I think in so many, in so many stories like this, pornography, pornography plays some vital roles in people, um, becoming authentic. Mm. And maybe that's, maybe that's the reality that I'm trying to hit. So I'm wondering, did it, did it make you become a better or worse Mormon? And did it help you become a better or worse person in your opinion? What, what do you think? Mm. I would say it definitely, it probably started the, the progression or started the journey towards becoming a worse Latter-day Saint, but absolutely started the journey for me becoming a more authentic and fully expressed and better person. It was the fact that uh, some people want and enjoy seeing a whole unfractured egg. But the beauty in that is that when you crack that egg open and escape <laughs> and are able to become free and the chick is able to stand on its own two feet, it's only because you fractured the egg. It's only because you broke it that you were able to eventually fly. Mm, yes. And oh I, my God, I love that metaphor. I, I like, I mean, I, that's what I kind of get out of this, this experience is that yes, uh, there is something to be said about a restrictive nature, um, whether it's Mormonism, family, personal conviction, but what happens when you break free from that? What happens when you allow uh, some fractures, uh, some light to enter into those darker spaces? What can we become after that? And all metaphors clearly, mm -hmm. but um, so I, I'm happy. I'm happy to see that there was some growth and some strength. At what point did you now have to, uh, clearly this is a podcast about sexuality and religion um, and authenticity and honesty. At what point did you have to have that conversation with yourself first about looking in the mirror and saying, I am, or coming out to your family? Really, I think it was a big part of it was just being educated being like more worldly, you know, going into junior high and all of a sudden it's not like this 
tiny little class of like everyone in there is Mormon or at least like 95% to like, you know, in junior high, maybe it's like 85 or 90%. You just have a little more diversity and kids are growing up. So you hear a little bit more about like, oh, okay, like now there's rumors going around that other kids in the school might be gay, so maybe it's not the end of the world. Maybe I'm not the only one, you know? And just having the word for it as well, um, just realizing like, okay, yes, I am attracted to other boys, um, and that means gay, you know? Like, which now, like, I don't necessarily even identify as gay. Like, I embrace it. I embrace all of the, all the terms, but... Um, I put myself in more like pansexual queer, um, if I have to put a label on it because I have experienced attraction to, uh, non male beings as well, you know, to, I've, um, had relationships, sexual relationships with women and, uh, with other queer folks and things like that, that don't identify as men. So, but at the time it was just like, oh, okay. Like I, there's something different that I'm feeling. There's a word for it. I'm gay. So allowing myself to say that within, you know, for a while of like, it did take a while of saying it within before I was ever, you know, probably almost eight years, seven or eight years before I actually like said it out loud. So maybe there were a couple years where I knew like, okay. And like had already started talking to other gay guys online and things like that. And just seeing that there, there was a world out there beyond what I knew. Cause you know, the, the Mormon church is just so very effective at making it like, oh, like, hey, this is us in this nice, safe little bubble. And everything out there is like so wicked and so scary and so bad. And so like, you know, if you're, if it's out of the bubble, then you're in trouble kind of thing. But to start to connect with other people and I'm like, well, they don't seem like a bad person. They're really nice and they're really fun and they're gay. Maybe it's not that bad. And, um, you know, even like, things uh like gay people queer people starting to be shown on the media shown on tv shows or on movies or things like that um and granted at the time it was still very much like the stereotypical like super flamboyant or effeminate like partying all the time like slutty whatever and so seeing that and being like oh okay well they're, they're that's still like a big jump to make from being mormon like i just like i just you know want a husband instead of a wife maybe you know i don't i don't think i necessarily am ready to be in in like dark late night gay clubs and drugs and alcohol and all those things like for you know for a lot of years i i wasn't really interested in in partying or substances or things like that i just wanted to feel closeness and intimacy with another man you know with um, at the time another boy <laughs> yeah, that makes sense i'm i'm super interested also in uh hearing how your coming out experience happened with your family because so much of what we've discussed so far in the interview has been about your individual and personal personal experience i often in this podcast will shy away from talking about the coming out and instead replace it with the coming or the letting in when did you start letting people in when did you start allowing people to get to know who and what you are at a deeper level with your own invitation and allowing them to get to know who Coulter really was behind the Mormon facade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was in, um, my junior year was, well, I guess it was before that I was already, I'd been talking to this guy that I met online on this. Um, if anybody remembers the website connection, um, I think it was based out of Australia or something like that, but it was like way back when, and that was, you know, where like the younger generation queer and gay kids could go and like just chat and meet and whatever. Um, and I met this guy that was living in Riverton, also Mormon, um, also gay and started talking with him and just being like, what? 
there's more of us out there. Like, it's like, well, there's at least two, you know, like me and this guy, like Mormon gays. Okay. Like that's something, you know? Uh, but as far as people that were in my life before that I then was allowing in, into my world, allowing to into my egg, um, it, my first friend that I told, I think was junior year. And we were just like, you know, having a heart to heart. And I told her and she was just like, that's cool. What are you going to do about it? You know, just like she, there was no judgment. There was no like, let's fix it. She was just curious, like, you know, okay, cool. Like, what are you going to do? And so just having that and our friendship continuing and feeling closer to her and more supported by her, it was like, oh, well, then I like came out to another friend and she was also really great. And she happened to be from, um, also a Mormon family, but more liberal, more progressive. And so came out to her parents as well. And her parents were really wonderful and supportive and started calling me their second, their adopted son. And I was calling them my second parents and things like that. And it was just a safe space to be me. And then, um, started coming out to more, more people like in school and, then my parents, my parent with my parents, it was like kind of a tricky one. It was not entirely consensual, <laughs> the coming out, um, at least the first couple times it was related to them finding pornography on the family computer and having some questions about it. And so, you know, the first couple times it was just like, they told me, they mentioned, I was just like, oh, frozen, like, nope not me. No, it wasn't me. You know, like just could not, couldn't physically say or do anything beyond that. And then I think it was probably like the third time that it happened. And then after that, it was like, okay, I got to have a discussion with them. I got to like actually say the words. And so, and it was so hard. Like I, like thinking back on it now, I haven't thought of this in years, but thinking back on actually saying it like I swear it was a multi-hour discussion of like kind of what's happening and what I'm experiencing before I finally could be like I think I'm gay and saying that out loud to my parents and I'm curious what your parents reaction was I mean not I'm sure it, it fulfilled a lot of uh it it completed a lot of puzzle pieces in their world and I think we can all probably be remotely honest and say they probably figured out you were gay based on the search history of your yeah. computer, <laughs> or at least you had some different interest. Um, yes. <laughs> aside from just a typical porn that was just happened to be on the family computer. Mm -hmm. What was the reaction like? Um, and, and kind of give us a glimpse into what that discussion was like. Oh, it was very serious and very heavy. Very Mormon. Sure. Very Mormon. Yes. It was just like, let, let's discuss and let's talk about it. And like, what does it mean and how are we going to fix it kind of thing? Did it start with a prayer? Just <laughs> get it. <laughs> always, always. <laughs> yeah, my parents are big prayers for sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, that discussion, it was, I mean, at the time it was interesting. I think it was probably my dad like started the discussion of like, we found these things on the computer again, whatever. And then, um, I don't remember him saying much else. He's like, you know, um, he has his boundaries around discussions and things talking about, you know, in his family, in his family of origin, there was not, it was very much like, surface level, keeping up with the Joneses. Don't, don't talk about the difficult things and the uncomfortable things. Just pretend like they're not there and everything's good because dad is the Bishop and like, you know, we, we can't have the ward know what's going on at home. So there was that. And then my mom is the opposite side of the spectrum of just like, let's talk, let's break it down. Let's process it. What are you feeling? What are the other feelings? Well, I'm feeling this. How do you feel about that? And so it was kind of, you know, on both sides of the spectrum were over overwhelming and felt like too much. You know, it was like my mom, I was like, I don't even know mom. Like, I don't even know what to say. Like, you're asking me all these questions I don't have answers to. And for my dad, with my dad, it was kind of like, are you listening? Do you see me? Like, 
are we really are we having this discussion or are you just like kind of like off in off in your own world um but yeah it was it was heavy and uncomfortable and i remember like basically as soon as i said i think i'm gay i was like I need to go basically like I'm, I got some friends waiting for me I gotta go and we'll talk about it later and then you know there were years following of discussions that were similar of um well well what let's figure it out you know like we can fix it it's not it's not a big problem and so my mom right away was like you know we'll get you in counseling you'll see a therapist like whatever whatever we need to do talk to the bishop um which i never did talk to the bishop about being gay i was like because as, as soon as i came out to my parents i was done with church i didn't want to go anymore i didn't want to go before but once I had that as kind of like an excuse, um, then I, I just stopped going. But I had talked to the bishop prior about pornography, about viewing pornography. And it just wasn't really a supportive or conducive experience. So it was kind of a space that I was like, well, that guy's no help. I'm not going to go to for, go to him for anything else for sure. And my parents, I, they, you know, they had their own agenda and motives and um, subconscious programming that they were dealing with. So, you know, they're, they were very limited of like, yeah, we, well, we fix it. That's what we do, you know, in the Mormon church, this has happened before. And you just like, you still go on a mission and maybe, maybe you'll get healed from that. And if it doesn't happen on the mission, then it happens when you marry your eternal wife in the temple. And if it doesn't happen with that, then once you start having kids, then it's just like, at that point, then you just like, will settle into and like, you know, knowing that, that was not a road that I wanted to go down because luckily I was at an age and time where stories like that were out and about, you know, people were talking about the, the experiences of, of these men who had gone down that route, who like came out and then were kind of like coerced or forced back into the closet of like, no, no, you're not gay. We're going to fix that for you. <clears throat> um, and whether through conversion therapy or just through like counseling and bishoping and then the the mission and the marriage and everything um but just hearing and then hearing you know years down the road the the broken marriages and the broken hearts and the sadness and people feeling like they missed out on their lives and children feeling betrayed that like their father wasn't fully open with them and all these things that happen. It was kind of, I feel very fortunate to have known those stories and been like, well, I, I don't think I want to do that, you know? So what are, what are the other options? Yeah, I think this is, this is interesting space because a lot of members of the church who are listening to this episode are nodding their heads um, who say, oh, I remember the, the mantra, mission, marriage, children, um, do those things, serve a mission, get married in the temple, have children. This all starts going away. It fades into the distance and then keep your eye single to the glory of God. Look forward to the eternities. The celestial kingdom is worth all of this. Um, but in your case, something was different because you bailed on the church, um, right after coming out. Um, and I think you alluded to it. You were able to see stories of other people. You were able to see, uh, the experiences and, and learn of the experiences of people who got themselves into mixed orientation marriages, which I think is a testament to those who are out here sharing stories and out here, um, paving the way for what I've often called the gay bees, the little baby gays who are falling out of the closet and finding their footing and learning um, and in, in very real ways uh, seeking and finding soft landings so they can stand up on their own two feet and run and, and run not away, but run in a healthy way towards um, who and what they are. So I recognize that you were able to recognize that uh, sooner rather than later. And it seems like that was a benefit. It seems like that was a good thing for you. In my case, yes, it feels like for me, that was, that was a benefit. Everyone has their own journey, their own story, but, um, yeah, for me, I think that was perfect. That was exactly what needed to happen. And so not to like completely, uh, 
switch from the the discussion at hand, but um, off air or prior to this interview, we started talking about sexual abuse and how that plays a role in your story. So not only was all this stuff happening at the same time, this um, epiphany of, of understanding and um, the embracing of the authentic and an understanding of the honest, but there was some pretty sinister and dark things happening in your world as well. How much of that do you want to talk about and, and how did that impact your experience? Yeah, I am an open book, so I'll just go ahead and jump in with that. Um, so from about the ages of four to 17, I was sexually abused by an older family member. He was about eight years older than me. <clears throat> and, um, that was also, you know, has also been a really, that was a big part of the, I think the discomfort that I felt in the church, you know, like starting basically the time I was baptized and I think just expected like everything to be erased and like just feel all better. And um, it wasn't, you know, like it, I didn't necessarily feel better about what I had experienced before being baptized of being sexually abused, um, which at the time, obviously in like a five-year-old brain, I didn't know like, oh, I'm being sexually abused. It was just kind of like, this is bad, I'm gonna be in big trouble kind of thing because this is happening. And then it continuing as well, like after baptism. And so that just created a lot of discomfort for me, like in the church space of anytime going to church, just feeling uncomfortable and anytime taking the sacrament being like, am I even worthy to take the sacrament right now? I don't think I am, you know, even before I was like, consensually or like choosing to participate or like look at pornography or anything like that i already felt like um you know the damaged goods or whatever and there's you know at the same time i'm hearing these general conference talks talking about like oh if you're if you're sexually engaged before marriage then you're just a lick cupcake and who wants the licked cupcake on the table like your chewed gum and like who wants a chewed piece of gum kind of thing so having that experience of just like oh whoa okay i guess i'm like you know here i am five six seven eight years old and like i'm already damaged goods i've already no good nobody want nobody's gonna want me um so what's the point of even being here and continuing and you know was able to to like keep the surface level of like oh i'm still still the good mormon boy go to church know the things um but knowing deep down or feeling deep down that okay i don't think the temple marriage is available for me i don't think that um, a mission's necessarily going to be available for me. Like I, I don't fit here. You know, it's been made very abundantly clear by various general authorities and stake presidents and church leaders that I am not welcome here, that I am not celebrated here, that I am not going to be welcome into the celestial kingdom and that God has basically already forsaken me was a lot of the feeling. What impact did this revelation, the sexual abuse, um, have on your overall f family dynamic? Oh, wow. It was, it just opened a Pandora's box of chaos for sure for quite a few years. So I was the first one to come forward about having experienced abuse from this family member. And at the time it was like i i first told my sister-in-law because she was she just was a safe space for me like she was in the family but like far enough removed from the, from the family that it was it was a safe space to talk about things and be more authentic so i shared it with her and she encouraged me to share it with my mom and I shared it with my mom and then my mom being who she is, wants to talk about everything and process everything and get everything out in the open, like, uh, had called a family discussion, you know, got my, got my aunt together, my grandparents together, got all, you know, all the adult members of the family together to say like, Hey, this happened. What are we going to do about this? And at the time it was, it very much went into, you know, like, um, 
my cousin who had been sexually abusing me, like his mom was like, no, that's not true. That didn't happen. He says that it never happened. That's like totally a lie. And other people that were like, well, no, like it, it did, it could have happened, whatever. And like, just everyone was, he says, she says this, that, and they're where we had been, um, a close family before, you know, I say close, we spent time together. Not that there were, there was a lot of like really authentic connection and conversation, but we spent time together. And after that, it really just seemed to drop off all of a sudden family reunions weren't happening anymore, or like fewer and fewer people were showing up. Uh, individual family units were breaking off and separating a little bit more. Like my family and his family were very much estranged. But years later, other people started coming forward, other people in the family that had also been sexually abused by this same family member. Um, some of them in even possibly more extreme ways and more extreme um, experiences than, than what I had, what I experienced. I wonder like in kind of the way Mormonism works or at least our understanding, uh, limited understanding in terms of, I'm thinking of your parents. Did you ever feel like uh, in their discussion or revelation as you're coming out and also knowing that you were sexually abused or the, the accusation of sexual abuse was out there? Did you ever feel like your parents said, oh, he could be gay because of this? Oh, for sure. Did that, did that ever <laughs> run through the vernacular? I have a feeling that that is like still somewhere in, in the minds of some of my family members. Yeah, I bring that up because a lot of the early church periodicals and a lot of the early teachings in the church, Spencer W. Kimball, Bruce R. McConkie, uh, Mark E. Peterson, the, like the OGs, they taught that. They taught that um, there were causes to homosexuality. The causes were um, an overbearing mother, a distant father, um, sexual abuse. Uh, pornography, um, not praying enough, not devoting yourself to the scriptures, not attending the temple. These were all reasons why someone would become gay. Um, too much male interaction, which is always crazy to me because when you think, oh, too much male interaction, what do we do with all of our, our youth who are 19 years old? We, for the first time in their lives, we send them off to missions. We put them... Um, in companionships together, we allow them to uh, spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week together, um, having these mission experiences and telling each other that I love you and that um, life is wonderful and good. And I just always thought that was fascinating. If, if indeed the church believed that too much male contact was a form or a cause of homosexuality, then why companionship and missionary work too? Yeah, it right? didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, so not, not much of a stretch to think that your parents might have blamed the sexual abuse on these feelings of homosexuality in our son. And it's probably also the reason why he was looking at porn and, and they start using um, outside influences to justify who and what you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you're navigating that world, um, it's got to be difficult. It's got to be difficult to try to uh, use language and correspond with your parents about how you're feeling and, and what you're experiencing. But if you move away from the church, kind of as we opened this episode, um, you move away from the church. Um, the church has been wholly effective at teaching us that there's no other, there's no other truth out there. There's no other place to go if you abandon us. Um, for you, where did you go? What did you do? And how did you survive? Mm. I was very fortunate to have some friends at that time that I could be more open and authentic with. And then really it wasn't too long after I came out that I like went on my first date with a guy and had my first kiss from a guy and you know was introduced to a whole new world and starting very small i mean he was also mormon we were kind of, we were each other's first kisses so it was very much a 
felt like a safe space to explore that and experience that and be like, oh, well, he's a good guy. He's like seminary president. And so if I, you know, if I have to pick a man to be with, he's probably a good one, right? Like maybe my parents will approve somehow someday. <laughs> and so there was that. But then, um, you know, I started favoring more. I talked about the double life that I was living for years. I just started favoring more that like secondary life and persona that I had created once I um, didn't really feel resonant or connected with the that like shell of a Mormon boy that I was clinging to for those years. Uh, and granted, looking back, there were definitely places and people that I was interacting with that were probably not very healthy for a 16, 17 year old boy to be in. Um, but it was still an introduction into what's available in the world beyond the, the Mormon bubble, you know? I think it's a really great point when we discuss kids who come out, um, and, and young people who come out in, in that age range that 15, 16, 17, 18 year old. There are a lot of programs. There are a lot of resources available. And I, I don't think this is even Mormon specific, but there are a lot of resources available to these young queer kids, uh, these young straight kids to learn how to date, to uh, create connection, to be able to um, have meaningful relationships. But when it comes to baby gays, when it comes to us as we come out or start identifying, where are the resources to teach gay kids how to date? Where are the resources to say, this is how you approach um, intimacy. This is how you approach connection. This is what connection actually looks like or feels like. I don't remember any of that growing up. I don't remember any resources available. And I, we're similar in age. I, I just don't remember that growing up in the 80s and early 90s where th these resources were at. So for parents who often say, well, like, I don't want my kids to get into nefarious things. I don't want them to make mistakes. I don't want them to be hurt. At the same time, if that's the case, I need you parents to start creating resources and, and making some of these opportunities available for us to uh, explore and, and to be able to uh, meaningfully fulfill um, those necessary needs of connection. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't have them, um, where did you find them? And how could, how could life been a little bit better had you had resources like that. Mm. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't have a ton. I like was finding them here and there, you know, I had my friends that I could be more open and authentic with, but they didn't really know how to, they weren't like Mormon gays, you know, so they didn't really know how to help or support. I had the, um, the one guy that I hung out with who was also Mormon. We like figured out some things together. But then after that, it was just kind of, a lot of ways I just jumped into like the very adult gay world or what I thought was the gay world, what was portrayed on, on media and whatnot, or what was talked about in church of like, Oh, this is what the gays do. You know, they're like partying and they're all naked and they're in dark dungeons and doing so many drugs and all these things. And so it was like, I got to the point where I was like, well, if I'm gay, then I guess that's what I'm doing. I guess that's what we do. So I went to those spaces, you know, starting at 17 year old, 17 years old, I got a fake ID and was going to the, the gay club, downtown Salt Lake. And, um, you know, still wasn't drinking or anything like that, but was just wanted to be amongst like-minded gay people. And, uh, and I found those spaces to be fun, you know, like people were liberated and free and I was like, oh, dancing's actually really fun. Like that's not something we do a lot of in the Mormon church, at least my family didn't, in my ward we didn't. And so like that was kind of fun and exciting. But then at the same time, you know, you have these older men there that are trying to give you drinks or give you drugs or and go home with them and whatever and not having any education around that or any support around that. It was just kind of like, well, is I guess this is what we do as the gays, you know, like I didn't even know there were other options. Like now I know gays of all kinds that like to hike and like to travel and like 
are Christians and um, spiritual and all kinds of things. But at the time, it was that was really all that was available to me was like the the gay clubs, the gay parties, and um, that was a little like you know in some ways free and liberating, but also pretty terrifying for like after coming out of the Mormon bubble to all of a sudden be thrown into that and be like whoa like so it was it was jarring for sure yeah and i get the sense that you alluded to this in the very uh beginning of your your episode that you're a naturist by trade that you are a spiritualist that you want to connect to earth and you're you're super grounded all of the everything you just explained seems further from who culture is naturally than you were becoming or exploring or finding maybe um it was it a gigantic leap to get to where you are today or how did that progression happen to get to a point where you sought your level where you were able to figure out um what was meaningful what was lustful what was ineffective what was not working for you um how and i bring this up because i think people who are listening to this episode may want to or may find themselves in your shoes as well they've recently come out they know the stereotypical gay things um a lot of those things don't resonate there are scene gays there are party gays there are drug gays but i've also learned that there's not just one way to gay mm -hmm. that there's a variety of ways to um understand and embrace your sexuality so for you even just my my family's backyard was looked out on timpanogos and like just looking at timpanogos i was like yes there is a god and he does love me regardless of what's going on because that mountain is so fucking beautiful sorry i don't know if I'm, i swear <laughs> um but then so like just starting to explore into that realm the very first thing that i remember doing was buying a book at barnes and noble called buddhism for dummies and so i got this book on buddhism and just started reading about you know a, a spiritual practice besides mormonism and seeing like oh this makes a lot of sense to me. Like this feels good to me. And, you know, Buddhism's a great introduction because it's just so chill. It's so just like, yeah, we're here. Things are happening. It's all good. We just do our best, you know, like it's like, which is so feels so opposite from the Mormon way of like, no, there's one way. This is how we do it. You do it every day, all day long, regardless. If you ever slip up, you immediately like must make amends and, you know, all of that. So to be connected to a mode of spirituality that felt just more relaxed and more chill was like, oh, this is great. And then the next was yoga. I started practicing, like my first uh, semester at university, I took a yoga class and was all of a sudden experiencing that, like, oh, that's what they mean by like mind, body, spirit connection. Because, you know, in yoga, you get into that flow and all of a sudden the thoughts fade away and you're just like so in your body and so present in your body and in feeling all of the sensations and um, all of the things that come up through that and connect connecting that was really a way for me to connect to the divine within myself you know like buddhism kind of made it like oh okay like there is a something bigger and i'm part of it and that's cool and then yoga was like oh okay there is something bigger and also it resides within me i'm i'm like a direct connection to it i am an expression of it and from there i just became obsessed with like everything studying taoism and uh first nations native american indigenous traditions of spirituality um hinduism looking into all the all the paganism definitely naturism animism and i found pieces of truth in all of them you know which was so liberating for me to be like oh 
the Mormons don't have all the answers. They they tell you they have all the answers. They do not have all the answers. There are there's truth spread throughout the world. You know, the Mormons have their truth. They have their pieces of truth. Absolutely, one hundred percent. I'm finding as I grow older and my spiritual um, philosophy progresses more, I find more and more similarities in what I believe in what the Mormons believe. And maybe I explain it a little bit differently and the timeline's a little bit different and whatnot. But to see that in a new and different way was just so like, oh, we're all just living our own truths and that's beautiful and that's wonderful. And I'm going to do more of that, you know? So just gathering pieces of what felt like my truth from all of these different philosophies and traditions. And, you know, because I was very skeptical of like, I'm not jumping into another cult. I've been there. I've done that. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm not doing organized religion again, <laughs> you know, like I'm down to like check out a Baptist church one week and then go to like Catholic mass one week or whatever, and then go to the, um, the Buddhist temple downtown one week, but I'm not looking to convert to anything. I'm not looking to get baptized again. So it was really beautiful to just have the opportunity to start to create my own spiritual practice from pieces, you know, and I didn't have to create it from nothing. Like there's so much wisdom out there. There's so much uh, guidance and experience. There's so many different ways to connect to the divine. Um, that, you know, I was experiencing in yoga. And then when I became a certified yoga instructor was doing a lot with breath work as well and found breath work to be very transcendent and a beautiful way to connect to the divine and really like connect to that oneness within as well. Um, so yeah, I found many different tools to, and, um, traditions to be able to create my own spiritual practice. And it just feels so good. I like that. I, I like that there are, are other options. Um, I, and, I, and I hope people who are listening to this episode who have stepped away from Mormonism or, or who are finding themselves in a nuance um, can see that there are other options, options that you um, have, have described. What, uh, what, what advice, um, what choices, what options, to say it again, could you give someone who is navigating this this space like you were for the first time? Um, you talked about breath work. That's something that's probably foreign to a lot of a lot of listeners. What are some of these things? Um, how how did they help you in particular? And what advice would you have for someone listening who's just hearing these terms for the very first time? What advice would you have for them on? beginning that exploration process, because I, I think you clearly show, at least in your experience, you were able to use, um, you came out and didn't necessarily want to run from spirituality. You came out and didn't want to abandon deity. You came out and didn't want to just fall into sin like the church promised you would. So what other options are, are out there for people to connect to something other than Mormonism? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say, first of all, you don't have to be quite as stark and extreme as maybe I was in my journey and process of just like, you know, once I came out, I was totally out of the church and like, okay, well, if that's the light, I'm going totally to the opposite side of the spectrum to the dark, you know, and not everyone needs to do that. And also you don't need to, um, just like abandon your faith and like, oh, well now, now I'm a Baptist or now I'm a Buddhist or whatever. Um, it's great to take baby steps into it, you know, like it's awesome to just gradually move into what feels interesting for you. You know, like maybe it is a, just a book on Buddhism that you read and maybe you still classify yourself as a Mormon, um, maintain your Mormon faith and practice, but you also are just getting a little bit of a new perspective, you know, because I find that most of the, a lot of the most of the spiritual philosophies, like if you boil them down to the very core essence, they don't necessarily contradict each other, even if they're not like saying the same thing, they're not always necessarily totally contradictory. So to be able to bring in just like a little bit of a different perspective from 
um, from elsewhere in the world, from a different tradition, a different background, even just a different person can really help to improve your own, um, your own like empowerment in your spiritual practice, you know, regardless of where it's at. Like, cause that's another thing that the Mormons are very effective of like, don't read other doctrine. Don't read anything anti-Mormon. Don't read anything outside of, you know, the, what the general authorities and stuff are saying on spirituality. We have everything you need for spirituality, but I would love to see more Mormons and non-Mormons, everyone just reading and experiencing, um, more variety, more diversity in, in their spiritual practices of bringing a little bit of Buddhism in and, you know, going to a yoga class once in a while and trying a breathwork class, you know, like breathwork, like I said, was very, I had no idea, honestly, my first breathwork experience where I really, I call it transcended, you know, like really went out of like the, the persona of Coulter as I am and connected to like that oneness, that like place of feeling unity and just feeling in the divine and the connection to the, to the divine was like, whoa, this is available to me just through my own body. Like I don't have to go out and seek it. I don't have to like pray so hard. I don't have to like go to the temple week after week after week after week. And like finally to like maybe have that experience of really feeling it, of really connecting to it. Um, just being able to like do this breath technique and shake the hand of God. Cool. Like, great. That sounds awesome. And there's so many ways of doing it. Like I, um, that's really what I've become an expert on are ways to connect to the divine. I call it experiential spirituality. So where so many traditional spiritual practices and religious practices are, dogma and doctrine based. It's all about like the teaching and the reading and the words, and this is how we do it. And, um, instead like actually spending more time and more energy into the experience of like, not, not seeking to understand God or understand the divine, but actually experiencing it for yourself. So breath work is a powerful tool that can be used, um, connecting in nature, you know, when you like spend a, you know, a, a, even a hike, you can do it, but it's even better. You spend a day or two or a few days out in nature and you just get like really connected and like really grounded into that oneness. Um, with plant medicines, that's where a lot of people are seeking connection with the divine now through ayahuasca and mushrooms and other things like that. Those beautiful plant medicines that have been stewarded over by indigenous traditions for many years and now are being shared in the Western world world again, um, as well as things like eye gazing. So that's another thing that I really love teaching of just like finding someone that you trust and feel comfortable with, whether it's a partner or a friend or whatever, and then just setting a timer for five minutes where you're just going to look into each other's eyes. And if you try that magic can happen. So <laughs> I, you may call this all crazy. Those who are listening or watching to this episode in this episode, but I had this experience with we, um, my good friend Gina Peterson um, was teaching a, a little course, like this class in California in LA uh, a number of years ago. And she wanted us to have these, um, these eye gazing techniques, to have this opportunity to stare into somebody's um, eyes for a while. And, and, I, and I tried it and I laughed when she said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to sit together and we're going to gaze into your partner's eyes. And we had to choose somebody in this group and we had to sit and I'm almost nose to nose away from each other. And we just stared. Um, and she's like, I don't want you to laugh. I don't want you. To, I just want you to look. And it was one of the most meaningful I've never had an exercise that has like, it changed me. There was something about just staring into another person's eyes and, and seeing the unique difference and seeing the, 
seeing someone in a completely different aspect in this, a completely different level that I've, I'd never experienced before. So I, I, I understand just even a, just a snippet of what you're talking about. Yeah. So I actually guided an eye gazing ceremony for my family, maybe four or five years ago. And they at first were like, what are we doing? Like Coulter, you're going to take us through what we have to do. What? Like, that's so weird. That's so uncomfortable. You know? And I like went all out. Like I set up the altar. I like wore my white robes and like was smudging everybody on the way in and everything, um, which for most of them was totally new, totally out of their comfort zone. And then tell them like, okay, you're going to be sitting and looking into this person's eyes for you know starting with three minutes and they're like what that's so awkward oh what oh i don't know about that i'm like just try it so they try it and after you know the, after everyone like the first minute or so they're like laughing and like what time is it so we have to keep going kind of thing but after the first couple minutes everyone settles in like i see tears start to fall um and then after the first three minutes everyone's like can we do it again i want to look in your eyes i want to look in your eyes and i'm like let's just do everyone everyone look at everyone's eyes so we ended up taking like hours for everyone to eye gaze with one another and at the end of the experience like my very Mormon family are like, I had a vision of you as a warrior of light and you were going against the darkness and you looked like so epic and amazing. And, oh, well, I had a vision and you're, you were like surrounded by sacred geometry and all these colors and everything. Like they're having these really expansive experiences that are, I don't think like anything they've ever experienced before. I think Not you slipped them some plant medicine <laughs> in the middle of that. <laughs> they might've thought so for sure, but it was totally like just the eye gazing. And, but based on what they were saying, I was like, yeah, that's what I see in mushroom ceremony. Wow. Like, <laughs> amazing. So it was, and it really opened their eyes, you know, and now they're, I think that it got them to look at my spiritual practice and things that I'm doing in like a more serious way of like, oh, Coulter's a little out there. He's a little weird. He's a little witchy kind of thing to now they're like, oh, well, what else are you teaching now, Coulter? What else are you working on? Like, oh, you, you did an ayahuasca ceremony in Mexico. What was that like? Tell me about it. You know, like there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of curiosity and I can feel there's, um, a lot more, respect as well, you know, but it took me showing up and sharing that because for years I really was guarded and protective over my spiritual practice and um, beliefs with my family. I didn't feel like a safe space to share with them. It's like, they don't get it. They won't understand it. They won't respect it. But once I started sharing things and showing up more authentically, they're like, oh, that's what you're doing. That's what you're experiencing. That's cool. That's beautiful. Maybe I want to experience that too. And so just allowing them, you know, to surprise me, not putting them in a box, not holding them in smallness of like, oh, they're like so close minded. They just wouldn't even get it. And just showing up and being like, well, let's try, let's just see. And I found out there, most of them are actually very open-minded and very curious and hugely respectful of other spiritual practices and traditions. That's amazing. And, and that we couldn't ask for anything more. I mean, uh, in Mormonism, we call this the unity of faith. Um, and what we're doing even on this podcast with this platform is really trying to find an opportunity of, of creating better understanding and getting to know someone in their difference and being able to, um, create commonality and to be able to, uh, live in harmony. And I, and I think I, I love that. I love that your super Mormon family is willing to jump on board with something that seems a little out there, um, but yet has so many familiar undertones that they're able to embrace that and, and connect with it. And I think that's also important as we, as we discuss um, leaving a religion to find, leaving a religion that promotes spirituality and happiness and, and all of these um, profound experiences leaving that to find that still, leaving that to still uh, see that 
they are available and the opportunity is still out there to embrace and understand that. I, I think that's beautiful and powerful and, and uh, exactly what we're all in desperate need of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's like so beautiful for me to see from a new perspective and to realize like, oh, there are people in the Mormon church who are miserable and who are, I would not say good people, not doing good things. Like, and there are people in the Mormon church who are thriving and happy and loving and living what, what I view as like a true Christ-like example. And there are also people outside of the church, whether religious or not, who are some of the most loving and Christ-like people that I have ever met. And they've never been to a Mormon church. They've never been to a Christian church even, you know? don't even identify as a Christian and yet they just exude love and joy and acceptance and happiness. And so to see that, that that's not really something, because again, they're so effective at being like, this is the only place you can find this, you know, that it's not even a possibility. And in my mind, it wasn't even a possibility until I was out for a while and saw and experienced more and met more people that I was like, there's so much goodness and so much light and so much love in the world everywhere. Why would I ever want to shut myself off from any of the avenues for it to come into my life? I love it. I, I love that aspect of it. And I think that's sound and solid advice. Now, as we wrap the podcast, um, I wonder what your advice would be to someone who listens to this for the first time or has heard of plant medicine, has learned of of, of spirituality um, in unorthodox ways, who wants to explore that? What advice would you give them? Um, and how does someone go about learning the ways? How does someone go about better understanding these experiences? Mm -hmm. Well, we are very fortunate to be in a day and age where there is so much um, access to these things. There's so much information available on the internet, through books, through workshops, through classes and things like that, um, that there's really no short of shortage of options. There's something for everyone. So whether you just want to dabble a little bit, you know, and you maybe download an app or join a, a website that offers yoga classes or offers breath work or learn a meditation technique even. Meditation was huge for me in my spiritual practice. Um, but if you're ready to like really dive in deep, there are people out there that are spiritual guides that do this, you know, that will, that can teach you and guide you either from their, their own like very specific background philosophy and lineage or that, you know, in my case, I'm more where I have backgrounds or I have, um, information and time spent from many different backgrounds. I, with my clients, like to offer a little bit of everything and just see what they like and what resonates with them. You know, like, hey, yeah, this week I'm going to teach you this Buddhist meditation technique and try that. And like, oh, you didn't love that? Okay, like, let's instead try... Um, this animal totem meditation and then that is like whoa i like connected with the eagle and it came to me and gave me these message and i had this this whole epiphany about my life and what to do with it um and then the breath work as well like the the breath work if you i guide a, a shamanic rebirth breath work that is consistently one of the most transformative experiences of people's lives. People tell me um, that they'll go through the breathwork ceremony and come through and just be like, I'm not even the same person. Like my eyes aren't even the same. I'm not even seeing the world the same way. Like I can't even go back to that person that I was because now all of a sudden I understand how big and how grand and how expansive I was. And I see that I was holding myself in like this tiny little box. So there's so many options. There's so many people out there that want to offer support and guidance. You know, for me at this phase in my journey, I still have my teachers, but I'm finding the greatest growth and fulfillment coming through guiding others, you know, connecting with the, the gabies and the Spira babies, you know, like new to spirituality um, and just 
offering options of like, hey, try this, try this. This is exciting. Let's share this. And then I see it in a whole new way. Once they come back and they report their experience to me, I'm like, you saw what? I want to experience that. That's amazing. You must be like super high level connected. Like, good for you. I want to do that. You be my teacher now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, I just think uh, I'm a big I'm a big supporter, a, a big fan, a, a big advocate of things that help us to um, achieve authenticity and honesty, and help us to do good, be happy, and thrive, and and really experience life for uh, what it should be, and that is often joy and happiness and and connection. What didn't we cover that you wanted to cover, uh, if anything, as we wrap the podcast? I feel pretty good. I feel like we we did a good spread a nice blanket over everything. <laughs> yeah, I think you I think you have a unique story and I, I appreciate it because it's uh it's an alternative other than just running from Mormonism. I think, um, you know, we, we both grew up in a church that told us that bring with you the truth that you have and we'll build upon it. That was this great Mormon message. That's what I taught as a missionary in the church was uh, looking at people of other faiths and saying, bring all of your tradition, bring all of your education, bring your spirituality to Mormonism and we will build upon it. And I think uh, stories like yours help us to see that other people um, have things to add, even post-Mormonism. Uh, other people have opportunities to bring, um, I, I, love, I love all of the different aspects that have been influential in your life, and I hope that they are influential for the positive in other people's lives as well. So for those who are listening or watching the episode and may want to connect with you, how, how can they do that? How do they find Coulter? Where, where are you hiding? Other than, I mean, you're not in Provo anymore. You're in <laughs> North Carolina currently. So um, how, how do people connect with you? Yes, I am currently in North Carolina and nomading around the world as well. Um, but you can always reach me on Instagram. My tag is at Coulter Wild. C-O-L-T-E-R-W-I-L-D. We'll put that in the show notes. Um, and that's going to be the best way right now. And the nomad, just gallivanting all over the world. Mm -hmm. How would it be? <laughs> it's nice. Yeah. I would also like to mention, based on what you last said, that there even is a great, I mean, there's a great spiritual awakening happening on the earth right now that I've been witnessing. And it's happening within the LDS church as well, you know, not necessarily that people are leaving the church, but that people who are still choosing to remain active LDS are becoming more open-minded. You know, I know people that are active LDS that are taking their families to do ayahuasca ceremonies in the jungle that are making yoga a regular part of their spiritual practice, not just fitness, but an actual part of their spiritual practice and creating the room for that, you know the space for that not that like oh ev it can only exist in my life if it's taught in the the mormon doctrine like i don't feel like that's true you know there's so much available that does not contradict or detract at all from choosing to be a member of a specific religion or spiritual practice uh just creating more space for you to explore and experience all that's available in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I've seen it too. I've seen Buddhism and I've seen even plant medicine. I've seen hypnotherapy. I've seen Reiki, um, all of these uh, different elements being infused into Mormon vernacular and Mormon experience and, uh, holy for the better, uh, in, or in most, in, in most cases for the better. And people are, are, are being able to connect to something they didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. And I like that. Coulter again, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Thank it's you for pleasure. giving us uh, an hour of your time to, or a bit more, to mm -hmm. uh, jump into your experience to better understand um, who and what you are, uh, the contributions that you're making to the world, um, the light that you are, and for navigating and charting in a very real way your own path. It has been an absolute honor, for sure. Thank you. And we thank you for uh, watching uh, this episode. 
or listening. If you are watching on the video version and have a message for Coulter, if you have a message um, or, or your own personal experience, uh, we invite you to share that in the live chat or in the comments below. And we are happy to have a real-time conversation or even um, maybe f some force free agency. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll get Coulter to pay attention to the online side as well. And, and he can chat and be involved in that conversation. I say force free agency because you didn't have a choice. I'm going to make you do it. Well, I am right now consenting to that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So if you are uh, watching on a video version through Facebook or YouTube, we invite you to comment. We also appreciate you sharing episodes like this. And if you are listening on the audio version, um, please subscribe to this channel and leave us a rating. Subscribing and uh, leaving a rating helps us to expand this podcast uh, into other areas and it allows other people to uh, experience our content as well. So we invite you to do that. And thank you for those who are subscribed. I will give you a little bit of a heads up. Those who do subscribe to the podcast versions of the podcast episodes do get them a little bit sooner. So if you do want to catch our episodes a little bit earlier than everyone else, be sure to subscribe through your favorite audio podcast player. Again, we thank you for giving us an hour of your time and thank you for uh, helping to support the Latter-Gay Stories podcast where it's stories like yours, uh, Coulter's, and mine that helps us each continue writing our own latter-gay story.